Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our gathering of Southside Baptist today. It is good to see you here and, um, and missed you last week. My family and I were out of town. We appreciate the um, uh, opportunity you give us to, to get away and um, enjoy some time together as a family. Um, but it is so good to be back with you today. Um, uh, Lori and her family are out today and uh, on vacation. It's just that time of year. And so we do want to remember them and uh, in prayer. The Lord will um, just bless their time away and um, give them a relaxing time, a rejuvenating time. Um, as they spend some time together as a family. Uh, but uh, so good to see you uh, here. And uh, if you're a guest with us, we are especially glad that you've chosen to join us in worship. If you need something, ask someone around you. We'll be more than happy to serve you in any way that we can here today. Um, it's such a privilege to be gathered together to worship the Lord. Um, we serve a God who has loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to rescue us from our sin. And it cost his son his life. He had to lay down his life on Calvary's cross. Uh, but praise the Lord, he took his life back up again and he rose up from the, from the grave. And so the hope of the gospel is that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ alone for salvation is rescued forever uh, from sin. We get to enjoy eternal life uh, with the Lord. We can enjoy the presence of God with us even now and, um, and uh, freedom from the power of sin in our lives. And so we're so grateful for the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, as we gather today, let's be reminded that we serve a God, we worship a God who has loved us in that way. Um, that even though He is holy and we deserve His wrath, He has sent His Son to rescue us from our sin. Church family, I do want to remind you of some announcements. And uh, if you want to uh, take a look at your worship guide, uh, I won't go through all of them, but do want to highlight just a few. Uh, hard to believe, but uh, VBS is right around the corner. And so volunteer signups are beginning today. And uh, hopefully next week we will be kicking off our registration for all of our children who are going to be involved, uh, but uh, in order for us to take care of all those kids all week and uh, share the gospel with them, we need a lots of hands on deck, and so um, go ahead and be thinking about how you want to uh, volunteer uh, for Vacation Bible School, and go ahead and be remembering VBS in your prayers. There's details in your worship guide about that. Uh, we also have our Boston uh, trip coming up in a few months, and I've had some people telling me that they're interested in going or planning on going, and uh, we'll kind of be finalizing who all's going um, very soon. The spots are filling up, our spots are limited for that trip, and, uh, and so if you're interested in going, want more information, please be sure to see me after the service, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Also, um, we, uh, you'll see in your worship guide that uh, next Sunday evening we're going to have an ice cream dessert uh, social. Uh, and um, if you can, make plans to, to be here for that. Bring something to eat. It doesn't have to be dessert. I mean, if you want to bring, you know, steak, you know, <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, that's fine. I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to bring it. Um, but, uh, but anyways, bring something fun to eat, and uh, we'll just have a good time together. Um, other announcements in your worship guide, um, I'll... Uh, let you take a look at those um, on your own. Um, Caitlin is going to read a couple of verses from the book of Psalms as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord today. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let's stand together and let's sing How Firm a Foundation. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. Yeah. 
so good to see them and hear from them and thankful for what the Lord is doing through them and um, also for the challenge that they gave to us. And because Christ went to the cross, we have a message to tell. We have good news to share with people. And um, so let's stand together and um, let's sing about that cross where my Savior died. Down at the cross, glory to His name. go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we thank you so much for how glorious your name is. Father, thank you for the cross of Christ. Thank you for that cross where our Savior died. Thank you for that cleansing from sin. Thank you for the blood of Christ being applied to our lives. And Father, thank you that um, that that fountain of blood, Lord, um, though that sacrifice is finished, sacrifice of Jesus is all complete. Thank you that that blood continues to cleanse us from our sin, that it keeps us clean as we just sang. Father, thank you so much uh, for that purification that just continually happens in our lives. Uh, Father, we, uh, we confess to you that we, we don't live up to your standard. Uh, Father, it's only by your grace that we are saved. It's only by your grace that we um, continue in fellowship with you. Uh, Father, if there is sin in our lives today, Lord, we pause and we, uh, we confess that to you. 
Uh, Father, uh, bring it to our attention so that we can, uh, we know it's there, Lord, just help us to see it um, and uh, so that we can bring it to the cross and, and confess it and, and find um, just uh, forgiveness and, and renewal in our, in our fellowship with you, Father. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of, of serving you both here and around the world. And Father, we do lift up um, uh, Anne-Marie as she is on her way to serve you overseas right now. We pray that you would watch over her and her team, give them uh, just safety and protection as they travel, and uh, then when they're on the ground there. And Father, most of all, we pray that they would uh, just be able to, to sow the seeds of the gospel. And uh, Lord, that you would um, take their efforts and multiply them for your kingdom's work. Father, thank you for, um, uh, for Elijah and Elizabeth, Lord, and, and just the way that they've been learning and their diligence and their studies as they uh, are preparing to be able to share the gospel in another language. Um, and so, Father, we pray that you would give them just endurance and perseverance as they finish out this uh, semester of school. And, Father, be with uh, their precious children as well as they finish up school and then um, do their, uh, their summer um, kids uh, things that they're going to be doing uh, while Elijah and Elizabeth are, are still finishing out their uh, classes. But, Father, we just pray that you would continue to bless them. And, Father, remind us today um, that every one of us, uh, just as Elijah encouraged us, is to be busy uh, investing in your kingdom. Father, using the gifts and the resources that you have given us, Father, to help people know that there is a Savior, that his name is Jesus, and that he is worthy of our lives. Father, as we continue in this service, Father, speak to us, encourage us, challenge us, and uh, Father, may you receive the glory that is due your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing one more song uh, before we enter to our time of the preaching of the word. And, um, and so if you would stand, we're going to sing, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And let this be just a declaration that even as we work for the Lord, we realize that it's Him that is working in us and keeping us close to Him all the way until we see His face one day. Jesus 
Church family, if you would, open up in your copy of God's Word to Ephesians, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, is our text for today, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. The title of our message is, From Divided to Reconciled, From Divided to Reconciled. Now, this is um, part of a larger passage that we began looking at a couple of weeks ago. And so I actually want to read um, that whole passage beginning in verse 11 through verse 22. So we're getting the context and then we'll focus our attention today on verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 11. This is the word of God. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him... We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord for his church today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, open up our hearts to your word. Father, humble us before your word. 
Lord, help us to desire to learn. Help us to desire to grow in our relationship with you. And Father, for those who have not trusted in Christ, we pray that your word would do the work of salvation that only you can do in their hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a kid, I remember a conversation I was having with a friend of mine, and while we were, actually I don't remember the conversation, I just remember having a conversation with a friend of mine. Um, we were pretty young, and uh, a man that we both knew, a friends of ours, he, he walked up, and I remember um, he looked at my friend, and he said, hey, I'm trying to get your dad to join us for the alumni game at the school in a couple of weeks. I can't remember if it was an alumni basketball game or softball game or something like that, but it was the school that we went to, and I um, and he was, they were having some kind of alumni uh, game. And, and I noticed that he, he looked at my friend when he said that. And I didn't want to be left out. And so I kind of chimed in and I said, hey, I don't think my dad will be able to make it. Um, and I don't remember. I gave some reason. I, I don't rem- even remember. It might not even been true if I'm being honest. But I said, I don't think my dad will, will be able to make it. And he looked at me and he said, uh, the, the man looked at me and he said, well, your dad wouldn't be able to come and play anyways because he didn't go to this school. And, um, and that, was, that was right. He was just speaking the truth. I had no clue what the word alumni meant. Um, no, no, no idea. And, uh, and we weren't from that town. Uh, my dad didn't grow up there. He definitely didn't go to school there. We had just moved there uh, a few years earlier. And, uh, and, and so he was just kind of letting me know this is an alumni game, even though I didn't know what he was talking about. Now, he wasn't being mean at all. Um, He wasn't being mean-spirited. He was just speaking the facts. But I'd be lying if I said that in that moment as a little kid, I, I wasn't a little bit hurt. Because for a moment, I felt like an outsider. And for a moment, I kind of felt second class, if you will. I felt that even though I lived in that town and went to that school, that I didn't really belong the way that my friends belonged. I didn't have all the rights and privileges that my friends had. Their dads got invited to play in that game, and my dad didn't. Now, please don't think that that scarred me for life. It was a great learning opportunity to learn what the word alumni meant, and, uh, and I have no bitterness towards that, that individual at all. Uh, he was just stating the facts. I simply tell you that story to make the point that feeling like an outsider is no fun, and probably all of us at some point or another have felt that way. But unfortunately, it's really easy, even in the church, to divide ourselves into different levels of Christians and view some as more Christian than others and act in a way that makes some people, even fellow believers in Christ, feel like outsiders. We may say we believe that the gospel is for all peoples and that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved and that all who are in Christ are equal in our standing before God. But in our practice, we may reveal that what we really believe is that even though everyone who believes in Jesus can be saved, there are different levels of Christians. Now perhaps you're tempted to place yourself into a self-invented upper level of Christianity. You look down on certain believers because they're different than you in some way. Maybe they have a different skin color than you or speak a different language than you or have a different family background than you or dress different than you or have been a Christian for less time than you. Or maybe you're tempted to place yourself into a self-invented lower level of Christianity. In other words, you, you feel like Yeah, I've trusted in Jesus, but man, I'm not fully in like those Christians are. I'm not fully in God's family the way those Christians are. I'm not really included among God's people. Brothers and sisters, our passage today destroys any notion that there are second-class citizens of God's kingdom, that there are outsiders among God's family, or that there are outcasts among God's people. And as it destroys that, that false belief, it ought to destroy any arrogance that we might have toward other believers who we might be tempted to look down upon because of some difference between us and them. And at the same time, it ought to, ought to lift the spirits of believers who maybe perhaps feel um, less than fully accepted by God. This is a passage of Scripture that should lead us to celebrate the work of God that He has done and is doing for Himself in building a diverse yet unified people 
for his glory. Now, a couple of weeks, we studied the first two sections of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Uh, we divided um, that, that first part into verse 11 and 12, and then verse 13 through 18. And we looked at both of those parts a couple of weeks ago. Today, we're going to study this third section, which is verses 19 through 22. So really, it's part two of that uh, message from a couple of weeks ago. And so we need to make sure we know the context. We don't just want to jump right into verse 19. Let me remind you of the main idea of the passage as a whole, and then what we learn from that first part, verses 11 through 18. Uh, Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 11, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 11 through 22 to teach us this church, that through the cross, Jesus created a new people at peace with one another and with God. This is the main idea for this whole passage, verse 11 through 22, that through the cross, Jesus created a new people at peace with one another <clears throat> and with God. Now remember, Paul is writing at a time where the division between Jew and Gentile was a very real division among people. I mean, this was a deep, deep, deep divide. It's hard for us to even understand in our day and time and in our uh, cultural context how deep the divide was between Jew and Gentile. And, and, and so we need, to, we need to think about this very real division. And even though Jesus came to unite Jew and Gentile, the threat of division within that early church was always lurking right around the corner, as it is in the church today. Verses 11 through 12, Paul called on these Gentile believers to remember their status before God saved them. I would encourage you to kind of scan your eyes through these verses as we uh, review for just a moment. If you'll remember, they were marked by hostile division between Jew and Gentile and marked by hopeless separation between them and God. And the reality is that the same is true for us. We are divided from one another and for all sorts of reasons, and we are divided and are separated from God because of sin. And so we learned this from verse 11 through 12, that we were once people marked by hostile division and hopeless separation. Remember, Paul said, therefore, remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hand. So he's talking about that division between Jew and Gentile. Then he goes on and says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. And that's the separation that we experience between us and God, separated from the king of salvation and from the kingdom of salvation, from the promises of salvation, from the hope of salvation and from ultimately only the God of salvation. But the good news then starts in verse 3. You see that, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Paul then goes on in verses 14 through 18 to explain in detail how that is. What is it about this blood of Christ and what it means to be brought near to one another and ultimately to God? And so we learn in verses 13 through 18 that in Christ, we are now a people united by a costly reconciliation. Friends, Jesus achieved this costly reconciliation, reconciling us to one another and us to, together to God. He achieved it by becoming our peace through his death on the cross and by proclaiming peace through the message of the cross. And so we see that Jesus destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. You see there in verse 14. And he created one new man in place of the two. He reconciled us both to God so that we, both Jew and Gentile, which means every believer in Christ, have equal access to God. And that equal access is seen in verse 18, if you'll look there for just a moment, where it says, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And that sets up the final section of this passage that we want to look at today. In verses 19 through 22, Paul gives, we could say, the result of that costly reconciliation that he's just described, which destroyed the hostile division and hopeless separation of verses 11 and 12. So the third truth in this passage, which is kind of our main truth for today, is this. Together, we are a people under holy construction. Where once we were a people that were marked by hostile division and hopeless separation... We are now in Christ, a people who have been united by a costly reconciliation. And the result of that is that together we are a people under holy construction. Under holy construction. Verses 19 through 22, Paul gives the contrast to verses 11 and 12. Paul says in verse 19, So then... 
In other words, what he's about to say is the result of Jesus pouring out his blood on the cross for people who were divided from one another and separated from God. This is the result of that costly reconciliation we read about and studied in verses 13 through 18. He says, so then you are no longer. There's a change that has happened. You are no longer, he says, strangers and aliens. Brothers and sisters, where once we were strangers to the covenants of promise, we are no longer. Where once we were alienated from the citizenship of God's kingdom, we are no longer. Where once we were divided from one another, we are no longer. Where once we had no hope, we are hopeless no longer. Well, then what are we? If we're no longer those things, what are we? Well, Paul gives three pictures of, of, of who we are now um, as a result of this costly reconciliation, verses 19 through 22. We're going to talk about these three pictures today. God's people are described as, number one, citizens of a kingdom, number two, members of a family, and number three, the building pieces of a temple. But not just any kingdom, not just any family, not just any temple, but, but God's people are described as citizens of God's kingdom, as members of God's family, and as the building pieces, the building material of God's temple. Look at verses 19 through 22. He says, so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are, here's picture number one, fellow citizens with the saints. There's the citizenship in a new kingdom. Picture number two, and members of the household of God. There's the picture number two of the members of a family, family of God. And then picture number three, here's the temple. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So God's people here in this passage are described as citizens of God's kingdom, members of God's household, or we can use the word family, and the building material of God's temple. Now, one thing we want to notice as we look at verses 19 through 22 is how each of these pictures describe our changed relationship to God. And then we'll come back at the end and we'll talk about our relationship with one another. Where once we were hopelessly separated from God, friend, now in Christ we are citizens of his kingdom, members of his family, and pieces of a structure which is filled with the very glory of God. And it's because of the cross of Christ. Because of the cross of Christ, we who have believed in Christ Jesus by God's grace are brought near to God. And the transformation in our relationship, it's mind-boggling. It's breathtaking. Let's look at each of these, three, these pictures, and I want to give you a truth statement to go with each one, okay? So a statement to kind of help us wrap our minds around and maybe summarize somewhat what Paul is saying here. So consider this first picture. We were enemies of God's kingdom, but now we are citizens of God's kingdom with all the rights and privileges that come with this citizenship. And so we could say it this way. Here's a truth statement for us. As citizens of God's kingdom, all believers equally enjoy the rights of heavenly citizenship. As citizens of God's kingdom, all believers equally enjoy the rights of heavenly citizenship. Let's consider that heavenly citizenship and those rights that we get to enjoy for a moment. The Ephesians understood well the concept of citizenship in the world in which they live. In that day and time, some people were citizens of Rome. And Rome was a large and powerful empire. Some people were not citizens of Rome. If you were a citizen, or a citizen of Rome, you enjoyed many rights and privileges that those who were not citizens of Rome did not enjoy. The Ephesians understood the concept of citizenship. But friends, what Paul is saying here is there a far better citizenship than that of Rome or any other earthly kingdom or country. There is a heavenly citizenship in the kingdom of God, and all who are in Christ are a part of that kingdom, are full citizens of that kingdom. What is so good about this kingdom of God? Well, we could spend much time talking about it, but just think about it this way. In this kingdom of God, we have the crucified and risen Son of God as our eternal protector, eternal provider, and eternal King. Go back and, and read through that first part of chapter 1 or all of chapter 1 and remind yourself of the eternal provision of blessings that we enjoy as citizens of God's kingdom. Go back and remember that we have been blessed in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What an eternal provision God has given us in His kingdom. 
And then you could jump ahead to the end of the book of Ephesians, to the last half of chapter 6, and there you'll read about the eternal protection that we have from King Jesus who protects us from the evil one as we battle against him. Know how good it is to be a citizen of God's kingdom. Friend, it ought to cause us to hold very loosely any earthly citizenship that we enjoy. It ought to cause us to eagerly sacrifice any earthly attachments that would keep us from being attached to God and His kingdom. And it ought to lift the spirits of anyone who feels alone or looked down upon or, or, or feels like they lack any meaningful sense of belonging. Friend, if you are in Christ, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now I want you to notice the second picture. Notice the second picture. We were rightfully rejected from fellowship with God, but now in Christ we are members of His family, members of his household. And so here's another truth statement for us. As members of God's family, all believers equally call God our Father. As members of God's family, all believers equally call God our Father. This household language ought to bring our minds back, take our minds back to verse 18. I read it a minute ago, but it's so good I'm going to read it again. Verse 18 says, For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. Brothers and sisters, because of our sin, we deserve to be separated from God forever, but in Christ... We say these words, but I mean, let it sink in for a moment. We have access to God. And it's not access to a domineering dictator, but it's access to a loving Father. Someone who loves us and cares for us deeply. We who had lost our place at the table of God. Think about this household language. We had, we, we had, we had full access to the table of God in the Garden of Eden. And we lost that through sin. We had full access, and so now we're, 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 we've lost our place at the table. But through Christ, we have been adopted back into God's family. Not as, not as rejects, not as outcasts, but we get to pull a chair right up to the table with God as our Father. And it's by the blood of Christ that we now can run into the presence of God, calling Him Father and enjoying that access that only a child of the Master of the house has virtue by nature of that father-child relationship. Not everyone gets to run into the, into the room of the Master of the house. Not everyone has full access some people are barred from entry at all. Some people can only come in when they're, when they're asked to come in. Some people have to knock, but a child can just run right in. Friend, that's the access we have to God. He is our Father, and we all have that access in Christ. Christian, are you taking full advantage of your access to your Heavenly Father? Are, are, are you... Are you are you enjoying that? Like, are, you, are you living in that fellowship with Him? Are you enjoying close fellowship with God uh, as you listen to Him through reading and studying His Word? As you speak with Him through prayer? I mean, how often we neglect the access that we have to our Heavenly Father. Christ died so that we could come in and call God our Father. In Christ, we are members of God's family. Now I want to consider this third picture. We were barred from the presence of God. To consider in the Garden of Eden for a moment. The flaming swords that were placed over the entrance. Once Adam and Eve were kicked out. Barred from the presence of God. We were barred from the presence of God. But now God is building us, get this, into His very dwelling place. Isn't that incredible? Like we were, we were completely kicked out from the presence of God. And now it's not like God saying, hey, I'll let you look over the fence <laughs> and, and kind of get a little glimpse of my presence. No, he is building us into his very dwelling place. We are pieces of God's temple. And so here's a third truth statement. As pieces of God's temple, all believers equally behold and manifest the glory of God. As pieces of God's temple... Or if you don't want to use the word pieces, you could use the word stones maybe. Uh, the, the Bible uses that word as well. Stones in the temple. Uh, as pieces, as building material of God's temple, all believers equally behold 
and manifest. So to behold means to, to, to see it and take it in, right? And then to manifest means to make it known. The glory of God. Now, Paul spends more time on this picture than the other two. And so we're going to spend a little bit more time on it as well than we did the other two. We can think about Paul's description of this temple in three parts, okay? First, the pieces of the temple. Second, the progression or the growth of the temple. And third, the purpose of the temple. So let's look at this in these three parts, okay? First, let's look at the pieces of the temple. Simply put, the pieces of the temple are the people of God. As the Apostle Peter said in one of his letters, we are living stones. That's what he said. We're living stones. See, God is not building a structure of bricks and mortar. The tabernacle of Moses there in the Old Testament, which then became the the more permanent structure, the temple of Solomon, those were merely a foreshadowing of a far greater temple. And that temple is the Lord Jesus Christ and all those who are joined together with Him by His blood, by God's grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. And it's an important point to make as we just, just consider the fact that the temple is made up of people. God's dwelling place is made up of people. It's an important point to make because so often we wrongly associate the word church with a building where we meet for worship. Now, you don't see the word church in this particular passage, but Paul uses the word church all throughout this letter, and he's describing the church here with these three pictures. If you want some pictures of what the church is, what's these three pictures? And one of them is the temple of God. But the temple, the church, is not a building. Friend, God dwells among his people whom he is forming with his own hands. He does not dwell in a building that we construct with ours. The church is a people to whom we belong, it is not a place to which we go. If you think about that, we'll realize, maybe this week, think about the times you use the word church. We often use the word church to refer to a place to which we go rather than to a people to whom we belong. And, and the problem with that is that sometimes that really can skew our thinking about what the church is. If we're not careful, we will be more devoted to a, a building or a place um, then we'll be devoted to the people who are actually the church. Or we'll think that it's only in a certain building or, or location that we worship God when really God is dwelling with his people all the time. And so it's important for us to realize that the, 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 the temple of God here, that's a, that's, a, that's a picture of the people. We are the parts of this temple. Now, notice that there's different parts of the pieces. There's different categories of of pieces here in this temple. There's the foundation, just like with any building, there's a foundation, and then there's the rest of the structure. And now the foundation, of course, is the most important part of uh, of a building, and uh, and everything is, of course, founded upon that. It's called the foundation. But then the foundation itself, Paul splits that into two separate parts, okay? So don't don't get lost here in in the details. We've got the, the temple, this picture of the temple. We've got the foundation and then the rest. And then in the foundation, we have two parts of the foundation. Look at what Paul says here beginning in verse 20. He says, we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Let's start there with that part of the foundation. The apostles and prophets. Who who in the world is he talking about? Well, the apostles were the select group of men who were eyewitnesses of Jesus and who were specifically chosen by Jesus himself to be the front runners in proclaiming the message of Jesus. These were guys like Peter and James and John and Matthew and Bartholomew and, and Thaddeus and, and, and even Paul himself came at a little bit later time, but he got to be a part of this group of apostles. And we'll actually see Paul talk about that in chapter 3. What about the prophets? Well, the prophets that Paul is referring to here, often we go right back to the Old Testament, but I don't think that's the prophets that Paul is talking about here. Um, He's talking about the people specifically gifted in the early church with proclaiming the message of Jesus as taught by the apostles. Remember, this was before uh, the the New Testament was written. It was being written. So they didn't have the the, the gospels to turn to. Uh, They had to rely on the eyewitness testimony of the apostles and then those who had especially been gifted with the gift of prophecy who faithfully proclaimed the message of Jesus as passed down by the apostles. 
And so this foundation is made up of apostles proclaiming the message of Jesus and these New Testament prophets proclaiming the message of Jesus. But the foundation is only as good as the cornerstone. And so Paul further describes the foundation by saying Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, what is the cornerstone in the building? Well, the cornerstone is the, is the first piece of block that's laid that, that then serves as the, the guide, the rule, the standard for the rest of the foundation and then the rest of the building that is built upon the foundation. If the cornerstone is good and set right, then the rest of the building will be good to go. Friend, our cornerstone is the best cornerstone that we could ever have. It is the Lord Jesus, the one who died on the cross to destroy our hostile division and hopeless separation. Jesus, the one whose blood reconciled people to God, to one another. He is the cornerstone. And so we could say this about the foundation of the temple, the church that God is building. Its cornerstone is Jesus who purchased our reconciliation and The rest of the foundation is the apostles and prophets who were proclaiming the message of reconciliation. So really, if you think about it, the foundation is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. Jesus dying for our sin and that message of Jesus dying for our sin being proclaimed. It is the gospel of peace. Jesus the reconciler and the message of reconciliation. But what about the rest of the temple? What about the rest of us? Everything that's built on that foundation. Well, that's all the people who, having heard the message of reconciliation and having believed in Jesus, the cornerstone, who purchased our reconciliation, have now been reconciled to God by, uh, by the blood of Jesus and been reconciled to one another. It's we who believe in the gospel. You can't be built on a foundation that you're not believing in. You can't be a part of being founded on a cornerstone in whom you have not believed. But if you have believed in Christ, then you get to be a part of this temple. Every Christian, both Jew and Gentile, is what Paul is saying, makes up this temple of God. So that's the parts or the pieces of the temple. What about the progression, the growth of this temple that we see here? What we see is part of this temple is complete and part of it is still under construction. Part of it is complete. Part of it is still under construction. Now, the part that is complete is the foundation, which includes the cornerstone. Remember, the cornerstone is Jesus, who is the way of salvation. And the rest of the foundation is the message of salvation, which was the message of the apostles and those New Testament prophets, which that message was written down in what we call the New Testament, which is a truthful explanation of the Old Testament. And so put together, we have the Word of God. And that is not changing. It is unchanging. It's not under construction. Jesus is the unchanging way of salvation as the cornerstone. And God's Word, which is the message of the apostles and prophets, is the unchanging message of salvation. Church, God has already laid a cornerstone. He set it in place and he put the foundation there. And anyone who tries to change it is not of God. Neither the means of salvation nor the message of salvation needs to change with the times. There's no progression or growth that is happening to the cornerstone and the foundation. It's set. But the rest of the temple... That is, the people of God built on the foundation is growing. There is progress being made, and there is progress to be made. Notice that Paul says, in whom, so he's just talking about the foundation, specifically Christ, the cornerstone, and so in whom, that is in Christ, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Notice the verb tense there. This structure grows and is being built. What does this construction look like? Well, church, it looks like people who are far off being brought near by the blood of Christ. As the message of reconciliation, the message of Jesus, this foundation and the cornerstone goes out, and as people continue to hear and believe the gospel, God's temple grows. Every time a sinner repents of his or her sin and believes in the gospel, another living stone is added to God's temple. A new life is added to the dwelling place of God. Those who are already stones in God's temple are also growing 
in maturity. You see, this temple is growing numerically. New stones are being added as people believe the gospel. But it's also growing in its health, in its sturdiness, in its maturity in Christ. Even once we are placed as stones in this temple, there's still growth to happen in our lives. And Paul actually talks about this in chapter 4 where he calls the church to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. And despite the work of the evil one who stands opposed to God, God's temple is progressing. His people are growing and God will complete this construction. As Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we've seen pieces of the temple, progression of the temple, but then notice the purpose of the temple. It's absolutely amazing. The temple is what? It is a dwelling place for God. It is a dwelling place for God. That's why it's called, notice here, a holy temple. Why? Because God is holy and it is His dwelling place. Why don't you think about what that means to be a stone in that temple? That means those those stones get to behold the glory of God. They get to see God in all of His glory. We are the stones. We get to behold the glory of God filling His temple with praise. And also those stones were meant to be a display of the glory of God. We go back to that temple there in Jerusalem, that foreshadowing of the better temple that was coming. Listen, it was meant to, in a way, hold, not contain, but hold the glory of God, but also it was meant to be a display of the glory of God for others. The peoples of the world, the nations of the world were supposed to come and see the temple and learn to worship the one true God who made the heavens and the earth. And friends, though the structure of the temple of God has changed from stones to people, the purpose of the temple of God has not changed. In Christ, we get the high privilege of being the very dwelling place for God, which means we get to both behold the glory of God and manifest, that is to make known the glory of God. God's presence, once manifested in the physical temple in Jerusalem, has now been moved from a place to a people. We who once were without God, as verse 12 said, have become and are growing into a dwelling place for God as this passage ends. As God's temple church, think about it this way. We have a front row seat to beholding the glory of God. And we get a front line position in the mission of manifesting the glory of God, making it known to the nations. And Paul's actually going to talk about that in chapter 3. Think about it. The holy God who can only dwell in holiness has taken sinners and He has made us holy by reconciling us to Himself through the blood of Christ so that we are now the very dwelling place of the Almighty Holy God. Church, this transformation is truly mind-boggling and breathtaking. If I could offer just one brief yet vital point of application at this point, it would be this. If God is a holy God and therefore His temple is a holy temple, then friend, there is no place for sin in the temple of God. Again, don't think I'm talking about a building. I'm talking about us as the people of God. There's no place for sin in our lives. We want to, at all costs, keep sin out of God's temple, out of our hearts and lives. And when sin slips in, we better get rid of it quickly by God's grace through the help of His Spirit, who, which this passage says, is Building this temple. It's a dwelling place for God. We're being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And we have the Holy Spirit living in us, making God's temple holy as we put off sin and put on the holiness, the righteousness of Christ. Now, we've really been focusing on our relationship with God as we examine these pictures. But Paul is saying more in this passage than just, hey, look at your new relationship with God. His main point is not merely that we've been brought near to God as individual believers, but that we have been brought near to God together with every other believer in Christ. Make sure you see this, church family. 
These pictures are not pictures of divided individuals individually enjoying a transformed relationship with God, but this, these are pictures of a united people together enjoying a transformed relationship with God and with one another. There's a, as a word here that drives home a singular theme in the midst of these three different pictures. There's a word that ties them all together, and it's the word together. It's the word together. Three times in verses 19 through 22, Paul uses a prefix in the Greek which means together. And guess what? We've already seen him do this. We've already seen him use this prefix back in chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. If you want to glance your eyes back there for just a moment. Remember he said that those who are dead in sin have been made alive together with Christ. There's one word, alive together with. It's got, a, it's got three letter prefix in the Greek stuck on the beginning of that that means together. We're not just made alive, we're made alive together with who? Christ. We're raised up together with Christ. And we're seated together with Christ. In the first half of chapter 2, Paul emphasized our togetherness with Christ in order to convey the means by which we are saved. But now in the second half of chapter 2, Paul uses that same prefix meaning together or together with to emphasize the result of us being together with Christ. And the result of us being together with Christ is that we are together with one another in the body of Christ. In verse 19, Notice that he says we are fellow citizens with the saints. That phrase fellow citizens is just one word in the original language. It's the word for citizen with that prefix attached to the beginning of it that means together. We are together citizens. And we see the word together again in verse 21 where it says being joined together. Again, it's one word with that prefix meaning together. And so it's together joined. Or you could translate it together fitted. And then verse 22, we see it a third time. I think Paul's trying to make a point here where it says we are built together. Again, it's that same prefix attached to the word built. We are together built. You see what Paul is saying? We are together citizens. We are together joined. We are together built. And my point here is simply to emphasize what Paul is emphasizing. Everyone who is together with Christ is also together with one another as followers of Christ, meaning there are no different levels of Christianity. Either you are in Christ or you are not. And if you are in Christ, then you are equally in Christ along with every other person who is in Christ. No matter the differences between the color of our skin or the language that we speak or the nationality of our birth, we are one one through the cross of Christ. One citizenship, one family, one temple. And so recognizing the emphasis here in this passage on the togetherness of God's people, which God is constructing for himself, I want you to go back and notice those three words which I included in each of those truth statements. The words, all believers equally. As citizens of God's kingdom, all believers equally enjoy the rights of heavenly citizenship. There's not any social system or I mean, so, social classes or a caste system in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God. We're all equal citizens in God's kingdom. As members of God's family, all believers equally call God our Father. It's not that some have the right to go in and call God Father and some have to just sit on the outside and maybe be invited in, maybe not be invited in. We all have equal access to God as our Father. And as pieces of God's temple, all believers equally behold and manifest the glory of God. See, it's not that some people in the temple have a front row seat to the glory of God and others have a back row seat. Friends, we all have a front row seat to the glory of God. And we all get the privilege of participating in the mission of God, making known His glory to the nations. Perhaps here is where the rubber meets the road for some of us. We love to think about our status before God. And that's not wrong to do. To think, I am in Christ I'm, I'm saved. I'm a citizen of the kingdom. I'm a member of the family. I'm a part of the temple. We should, we should rejoice in that. But sometimes we don't like to think about the truth that our status before God is equal to every other believer's status before God, no matter how different they may be compared to us. At the beginning of the sermon, I made these two statements. I said, we may say that we believe that the gospel is for all peoples and that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved and that all who are in Christ are equal in our standing before God. But in our practice, we may reveal that what we really believe is that even though everyone who believes in Jesus can be saved, there are different levels of Christians. 
I know that we've seen from God's word the togetherness created by the gospel among the people of God. If you'll allow me to prod for just a moment to test whether or not we truly believe the reconciling power of the gospel. When someone who is a believer in Christ, but who dresses different than us, or has a different skin color than us, or who speaks a different accent than us, or who grew up in a different country than us, walks into our church gathering, or is interested in joining our church family, do you ever, and you just think about you, before God, do you ever find yourself thinking, well, that person seems a little out of place here. I mean, I'm glad that she's a believer. I'm glad that he's a believer, but she or he might need to find a church that's more like her or him. Friend, that thinking is completely out of step with the cross of Christ which has made us both one. Can I prod one more time and then we'll close? I want you to consider another example. It's easy for us to celebrate the salvation of someone from a different nationality than us. We call that the Great Commission. And we get excited. We should. And I think as a church, we do. We get excited about the Great Commission We are great commission people. We give money and time and resources to seeing the gospel go to all peoples because we believe all peoples can be saved if they will call upon the name of Jesus for salvation. But what if, just what if, it's just hypothetical, what if this church, I'm going to just give this as an example. What if this church was looking for a pastor? What what if this church was looking for a pastor and received a, a resume or a recommendation from someone of some pastor who was qualified in every way to be a pastor. He loved Jesus, had good, solid, biblical, theological training, had great experiences, had wonderful references, and most importantly, he met all the requirements of the office of pastor laid out for us in Scripture. But then you flip the page in that resume, and he's got a picture of himself there. And you realize that he is Chinese in his ethnicity. You see, he, he grew up in China and some missionaries went there and they shared the gospel with them. Hey, we even funded those missionaries. We sent them there, shared the gospel with them. That, that young boy trusted in Christ. Later, his family moved to the United States and he, he became a citizen here and has made this his home. And God called him into pastoral ministry. What do you do? Is he no longer qualified to be the pastor of this congregation because he looks different than most, if not all of us? What if he was of Hispanic origin or African origin? In other words, what if he didn't look like most of us here today? Church, if we are willing to call him a brother in Christ, but say that simply based on his family background or the color of his skin or the shape of his face or the accent with which he speaks that we could not submit to his leadership in our church, then brothers and sisters, we are guilty of denying the very gospel of Jesus Christ that we claim to believe and that we say that we proclaim. For the cross, all peoples stand guilty before a holy God and through the cross, All peoples who believe in Jesus are equally saved and given equal status in God's kingdom, in his family, and among his people whom he is building for his glory. And as we'll see as we continue into chapter 3, actually God's glory shines brightest when the church looks as diverse as it possibly can. It's at the heart of our passage of Scripture today. There are no second-class citizens of God's kingdom. There are no outsiders in God's family. And there are no outcasts among God's people, His temple. Are there things that make us different? Absolutely. And, and, and are all people equally qualified for every position of service within the church? No. Paul's actually going to talk about that in chapter two, where, excuse me, chapter 4, where he talks about we have different gifts and different abilities. The church is a diverse people, but in our standing before God, we are equal. Equal citizens of God's kingdom, equal members of God's family, equal stones in God's temple. Together, together, we are a people under holy construction as the triune God 
God the Father, Son, and Spirit, we see the triune God in this passage as He builds His people through the finished work of Christ the Son and the continual work of the Spirit, saving sinners and uniting us in peace to God and to one another. Praise God that through Jesus we go from divided to reconciled for the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the gospel that unites us to you and unites us to one another. Father, help us to live out faithfully the salvation that you have so graciously given to us, the salvation that has transformed us. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is at work right now in us, building us into the people that you have called us to be, a holy people. A united people. Because you, Lord, the triune God, are a holy and united God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's respond to the Lord, lifting our voices in praise and adoration to our great God.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. And it is in His power that we stand. And it is in His power that we stand as citizens in your kingdom, as members in your family, and as stones in your temple. And it is in His power that we live out the implications of the gospel, the togetherness of the gospel, where we don't just enjoy the privilege of being a part of your family by ourselves, but together with all believers equally before you. Father, we live out the gospel. Help us, Father, by your power in us for the praise of King Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.